Let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 once again. You know, the Apostle Paul used many different words to describe us, believers. He called us soldiers. He called us farmers. He called us saints, faithful, bride, child of God, sheep, my favorite, peculiar people. But the one he used more than any other word to describe us in the New Testament was the word brethren. That's a neat word. It, it, it just shouts family. Family. He used the word over 60 times in the New Testament. But to me, the fascinating thing is that he used it almost half of those times to this one church. Isn't that amazing? 60 times in the New Testament, all these different churches, this one church gets called brethren 27 times. It must have been a very special place. Of course, if you've been with us the last couple weeks, you'll know that we've been studying the, the return of the Lord Jesus when he comes back with his saints. And so we're going to get to meet those people one day. And what a glorious day that's going to be as we focused on it. We, the day that he comes to gather us up together with him, to be with him forever, when he establishes his kingdom forever, and we never have to deal with the flesh and the enemy and the world again. Wonderful. We got a glimpse into the future the last couple of weeks. Ponder that one. The world picks up the, the headlines. We turn on the news and, and the panic and the fear, but you and I turn it on with confidence because we know the future. Isn't that great? The prophecy was never given to us just so we could be in the know. It's not how we're to do prophecy. In fact, we could say prophecy is intended to do us. Peter put it this way, seeing as we know these things are going to happen, what manner of people should we be? Because we know we should live very, very differently. And so the last couple weeks we've been looking at what is going to happen. We're going to begin to look as we wind down this book at now how we are to live. This final whole section of Thessalonians is like a family talk. You ever have those? Where the, where the mom or the dad says, we need to talk. And it's not necessarily bad, but it's that we can do better. And that's kind of the way I would, I would take this as the, uh, we wind down this book. We've seen that this is a wonderful church. There's very little criticism from Paul. But though a wonderful church, it was not a perfect church. Why? Because there's no such thing as a perfect church. The church is made up of imperfect people. In fact, let me share with you, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go there. You'll ruin it. <laughs> and so that's how it is with the Thessalonian church. It's, it's time for a Holy Spirit family talk to say, you know what? We're doing really good, but we can do better. And so we're going to title this Instructions for the Family of God. Just stand together and just, just read this very short section. Verse 12, we beseech you, brethren, there's that word, to know them who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and for you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brethren, there it is again. Warn them that are unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, support the weak, be patient with all men, and see to it that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Father, a family talk, a time for praise, a time for encouragement, a time for challenge. You're doing great. Now here's what we need to do to be greater still. Very appropriate words for Grace Life Fellowship. If you think of the Thessalonian church, I think you think of Grace Life Fellowship. It's a wonderful place where people are on the same page and the page is Jesus. But we can do better still. So Father, may your spirit capture our hearts and minds and we'll walk out of here today committed to even doing greater. 
as we rest in the power of your Holy Spirit who makes it possible. In Jesus' name, let's say it. All right, in every family, if you think about it, there's a very valuable commodity called parents. Children may not see it that way. But parents occupy a very important role. They occupy the role of teacher and guide and overseer and protector and provider. They lead the family where it needs to go. In the family of God, it's the same way. In this thing called the church, there are those who are spiritual parents. In the New Testament, they're called elders. And sometimes the reference to them is called fathers. On Paul's first missionary journey, as he began to establish churches all over Asia Minor, in Acts 14.23, it says that he established elders in every church that he started. Did you note the plural? Elders. Nowhere did he ordain one man. One man should never have authority by himself. It's too dangerous. He's got the flesh, and the flesh is a very real enemy. He's got the world. He's got the church. He needs protection. He needs protection from others. He especially needs protection from himself. The great danger is that a man can begin to believe his own press and fall into pride. One of my favorite verses I quote it all the time is in Proverbs 11, 14. There is victory in abundance of counselors. Team. Team. That's what we're after in the New Testament. And we need that because wherever people are assembled together, there must be authority or there'll be chaos as each individual pursues what they want independent of the others. And so in Romans chapter 13, we're actually taught in the New Testament that God has established all order, all authority for the purpose of maintaining order within a society. And they have authority to protect the innocent and to punish the evil in order to protect that harmony and peace among that individual unit of people. So it's very important that we put the right kind of leader into authority in order to accomplish the purposes of God. And over the years, we've studied that many, many times. We're not going to take the time to do that this morning. We've studied that they are to be the right leader in terms of character. And we've also studied how they are to lead. We don't lead the way the world leads. These are servant leaders. They lead by example. Theirs is not an order, follow me. It's an appeal. Will you follow me? Because I'm following Jesus. That's how we want to lead. We seek a quality of man. We seek a man who isn't concerned about a title, but is concerned about his own personal character. Does that make sense? Now, and you look at the Thessalonian letter, and you've been with us, there is absolutely zero exhortation to the leaders of that assembly. And we know he ordained elders in that church. So we can make the assumption that they're doing a pretty good job. Today, however, we come across an exhortation for the body in terms of how to respond to their leaders. And I was racking my brain. You know, we've been here 27 years. I can't recall a single time where we actually focused on how the body is supposed to respond to the elders. So this is a first. And uh, when I look at it, I don't know. We should have done it 27 years ago. (laughs) This is a very important passage, in fact, for the modern church. I do a lot of reading, and the latest statistics are that 50% of every seminary graduate since 1990 is no longer in the ministry. That's huge. A recent survey I read said 60% of pastors surveyed would quit the ministry if they could find a job of comparable pay. 60%. The average length of stay for a pastor in a local church is three years, which is fascinating because, you know, the first 18 months, two years is kind of a honeymoon stage. You know, everybody's getting to know each other, love each other, putting their best foot forward before reality sets in. And then if the third year goes bad, you head off, get another honeymoon for a couple of years. It's tragic. The church in America, my friends, is in trouble. And so this is a very appropriate passage for us today. We're going to talk about ministering to the minister, shepherding the shepherd, caring for the caretaker if you will. Let's tear into verse 12 and look at it. Notice that the first word he uses is, I urge you, I beseech you. This is so serious in Paul's heart and mind, we could literally translate it, I beg you. 
I beg you to honor them, respect them, appreciate them who have charge over you. Now, those are all good translations, but you might want to circle that word honor or respect or appreciate because the King James got it better. It's actually the word oida, and we should translate it know them. This is a word of the mind. This is a word of understanding. And so what Paul is really saying to a congregation is, do all you can to try to understand the role of an elder. Walk in their shoes for a little bit, if you can, so you can get what it is they're doing. Notice verse 12 a little further. He doesn't call it work. The normal Greek word there used is ergon. Ergon, work. He doesn't use that. He uses a very intense word called kapiao. And it doesn't mean work. It means labor. It means severe labor. Labor to the point of exhaustion it is an extremely strong word. I would put it to you this way. People work is hard work. People work is a work of the heart. People work is a, is a work of the gut. You see, people can make choices against other people and devastate them. You know that can happen? You've been the recipient of it? People can make horrible choices against themselves and end up with devastating consequences in their lives. Has that happened in your life? Or you know someone that it's happened to? And then there's just this fallen world, and the fallen world can bring circumstances and illness and loss of job and devastation to you as a human being. Where do you go for help? When you go to the shepherd, the shepherd hears the anguished cries. And what I want to share with you today is that if there is a devoted a shepherd, if there is a devoted pastor, a devoted elder, I will tell you this with all my heart, it's impossible for him to leave his work at the office. They stay with you. I go home many times after hearing those anguish cries. And Janet will say, what's wrong? And I said, I just had somebody in today. I can't get them out of my gut. I can't get them out of my mind. I can't get them out of my heart. It's so sad what they've been through. And they can stay there for days and months and even years. And so Paul says, understand this work. Understand it secondly. Look what he says, because they're among you. What does that mean? I think it simply means they're one of you. They are doing shepherding work when they themselves are just a sheep. I'll put it to you just as black and white as I can. I'm doing a job that I'm not up to the pay grade. I don't have the resources. And we do it with a warning from Hebrews 10 that we got to give an account to God for how we do. And we do it with a promise from James 3 that when we do it, we're going to get greater condemnation. We're going to get condemnation from people in the process of doing it. When I got here in 1991, I came to bring the grace of God. Is there anything more wonderful than the grace of God? And got called a heretic and a false teacher for doing it. Had people slander me, tell, telling me that I was having an affair, that I was, my marriage was falling apart. I know that was true. Know this, Paul says, they're among you doing a supernatural job. They're just a man. Thirdly, know them, understand them, for they're over you. This doesn't mean that we have authority over people. There are far too many out there that think that's the way it is, and it becomes shepherd dictators. I have no authority to tell you to do anything. The authority that an elder has is an authority over the collective flock to establish a path for the flock. They lead by example. They go to the front of the pack and say, we'll chart the territory. Will you follow us? You know, I, I, this is a secular reference, but one of the truest fathers I've ever read of is a guy named Hal Moore. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore. I read his book called We Were Soldiers Once, 
and young. And Mr. Moore had a philosophy for going into battle. He said, my boots are going to be the first ones on the ground. I'm not going to ask those men to do anything that I don't do first. And when the field of battle is done, my boots will be the last to leave. And they will leave only after every single one of my men has been accounted for. That's a father. That's a shepherd. That's an elder. In the spiritual world, it would be a sheep. And I trust you know that's a very daunting task. Thirdly, he says, know them, understand them, because they admonish you. Oh, that, that sounds so strong. It's not. You might want to circle that word admonish. It's the Greek word nutheteo. It just means to put in mind. The role of a shepherd is to, to instruct and to remind when people forget what's been instructed. That makes sense? You see, because the world is so tough, you know, I get people in my office all the time and say, I can't. You can't what? I, I can't love that guy anymore. Oh, yes, you can. That's a lie. Because the one who loves infinitely is inside you waiting to get out. I just can't forgive. Oh, so you're going to live in bitterness for the rest of your life? That's a lie. The eternal forgiver is inside you waiting to provide the power for you to forgive and live in freedom. See, those are lies. We have to refute them. And then we have to teach the truth. Have you ever just thought about that? A mere man is going to stand up and teach the word of the living God. Talk about an awe-inspiring thing. And you can't teach what you don't know, so you got to study. But no matter how much you study, there's always going to be more that you don't know than what you know. You know, that's one of the things I've learned now over 37 years of ministry. The more I, the more I study, the less I know. And so before you ever become a teacher, you first and, and then always got to be a student. And then you've got to define really what a teacher is. So I think the church is very confused about this. I listen to people say, oh, they're, so, they're such an amazing teacher. No, I don't think so. I think they're an amazing speaker. There's a big difference. It doesn't make you a great teacher when you're given the body of Christ principles and rules and standards and obligations that are contrary to the ethic of the New Testament. That's a teacher. Excuse me, that's a speaker, not a teacher. What is a teacher? A teacher who gives the body of Christ the living Jesus. A teacher is somebody who gives the church the economy of grace, the finished work of Christ. But then we're going to take it even one step further. 1 Corinthians 4 tells us there's a lot of teachers, but very few fathers. Well, what's the distinction there? A father is somebody who doesn't just give his mind, he gives his heart. He gives his life. That's what Paul said to these Thessalonians. I didn't just give you the gospel, I gave you my life. So he speaks the truth in love. He refutes the lie with love. And do you know, do you understand that all the while he's doing that, he's doing it to sheep as a sheep. He's just a man himself. And he'll always preach a better message than he practices. Don't say amen, Jared. And what's Paul saying? He said, if you could do that, if you could know, if you could walk in the shoes, if you could understand, then you'd esteem them very highly. Did you see the words very highly? That's a double compound superlative. Are you impressed? <laughs> it means you'd go out of your way to encourage them. Not because of who he is. No way. Oh, he's so charming, he's so funny, he's so charismatic, he's so personable. None of that enters in. You esteem them for one reason, verse 13, the work they're doing, only for the work. And this does not mean we put a guy up on a pedestal, and it certainly doesn't mean we're blind to their faults, right? We need to go into that man's life and help him in his own journey. Thank you, Grace Life, for doing that in my life. What it means is we never take for granted the work. Listen. Please listen. 
The church is the most blessed institution on the face of this planet. The church is the only institution ever established by God himself. The church was promised to be eternally blessed. The church is defended by God himself to the point that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The church is people who were bought by the blood of God. That puts value, significance, esteem on every single one that walks in the door to be part of the assembly. The church is the pillar of truth in a world that's filled with lies. The church is the light of the world in a world filled with darkness. And this is a task, taking care of the church, taking care of people, which is worthy of honor, respect, and appreciation. So Grace Life Fellowship, thank you for 27 years of doing that with our elders, and especially with me. You know, I was reading scouring books and working on this and meditating all week. And I came across a very obscure verse in Galatians. Listen to what it says. He's writing to the Galatians and he says, you received me as an angel of God. Did you receive me as an angel of God, Dennis? (laughs) He said, you received me as the Lord Jesus himself. That's high praise. But then he went on in the verse to say, I give you witness, I testify that some of you would have plucked your eyes out for me. Would you go that far? (laughs) What was Paul communicating? I see your hearts, and your hearts are so devoted to the church, the cause of Christ, and to its caretakers. And I praise you for it. Let's go to verse 13. One of the best ways to do that, one of the best ways to honor and appreciate the shepherd is to live in peace with each other. Live in peace, please. (laughs) This exhortation, of course, is in reference to that infamous verse, wherever two or three are gathered, there's sure to be conflict. (laughs) Testimony from any of the married people? (laughs) And we're not going to stay long on this. You know it. Conflict resolution is exhausting. Conflict resolution can sidetrack us from what we really need to be doing. Can really rob our time. And we have so little of it. Strive to live at peace. And understand, this is not saying strive to get peace. One of the things we have to realize in the New Testament that we already have peace. We already have harmony. We have been made the one new man. Whether you're male, female, Jew, Greek, slave, free, rich, poor, male, whatever. We are already one. The hard work's been done. All we got to do now is keep the peace. (laughs) Protect the peace. Preserve the peace. Because we already have the peace. And again, you've done a great job of that. When you stop for a minute and ponder this overwhelming role of sheep caring for sheep, let's think about it. There's no one man that's ever up to the demand of doing that. I would say this, it's only the Zoe life of God in a man that can equip him for the task. And having said this, I'll go one step further. Even the Zoe life of God in a man is not enough say, what do you mean by that, Frank? No one man, not even a plurality of men, even if they're spirit-filled, can adequately care for an entire flock. The work's too big. Does that make sense? The work's too big. I don't know, what do we have here? Six elders, seven elders? They can't care for an assembly this size. What has to happen is the flock has to care for the flock. That's why in Ephesians 4, it says the very best thing a shepherd can do is equip the saints so the saints can do the work of the ministry. So the saints mature, so the saints supply one to another, so the saints build up the body of Christ by themselves. And again... I can't heap enough praise on this place. You've done that. 
It's a congregation of shepherds. You shepherd each other wonderfully. Apparently, the Thessalonians needed a little work in that. So let's look at what he added, because this can apply to us too. I beg all of you, admonish the unruly. Put the car in park. Did you hear that? Flock. When you see somebody in the body who's getting a little unruly, you take care of them. Notice that it didn't say go to the pastor so he can take care of them. That would be very unfair. That would be like the wife who's always saying, wait till your father gets home. That turns the father into the bad guy. And the kid starts to dread dad coming home. I've experienced that. I've called people up for a very easy, nice thing, and they go, uh-oh, what did I do? <laughs> or I go to somebody and say, hey, can I talk to you? Why? What did I do? I just wanted to talk. <laughs> Don't make the pastor the bad guy. It's the body's responsibility to deal with the unruly members of the body. In other words, Cain was wrong. Remember the question Cain asked? Am I my brother's keeper? What's the answer? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. We're all responsible to care for each other. Well, who are the unruly? This is an interesting word. You might want to circle it. A tactos. It's a military term for somebody who gets out of step when the rest are marching. Body. There are people who will get out of step in this assembly. They'll function like lone rangers. They'll want to do their own thing, do it their own way. Very often, they've got hidden motives. They're not content to be part of the body. They want to shine. But they can become very critical, very negative, very divisive. They can become slanderous and gossipy. They can quit serving, quit giving. They're following their own agenda rather than the rest of the body. And it can be very dangerous if it's left unchecked. They need to be brought back into step. So when you see somebody doing that, Go after them in love. Look at verse 14. Encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage the faint-hearted. Where the unruly maybe need a strong hand, there are other people that need a gentle hand. Did you know that? Circle that word faint-hearted. You know what it literally means in the Greek? Little-souled. Little-souled. It's just... It's just not a lot of fight in them, not a lot of strength. Now, I read book after book after book studying this passage, and I found several writers that translated this quitters, the quitters. That is horrible. Uh, it's horrible for them to think that. It's even more horrible to put it in print. I've said this so many times in this church. We'll say it again. We were designed to live in the Garden of Eden. This is not the Garden of Eden. And therefore, th the world under a curse, things are going to happen to us that we were never designed to have happen. And it can knock us down. And it can happen to any one of us at any time. Someone will make a choice that devastates us. We make a choice that ruins us. Circumstances come that debilitate us. And we become faint-hearted. We become little-souled. And the way I would prefer to translate it, we can get overwhelmed. It can happen so fast and so furious and so powerfully that, that we, just, we just shut down. Paul says, encourage those people. Fascinating word, paramuthos. Give them near speech. Near speech. That's what it literally translates. Words that are tailored perfectly for the situation. Words that come without condemnation. Words that, that encourage the heart. And, and maybe they're done with, a, with an embrace because it's called near. Near. You know, you can't help but think of the one who did this better than anybody else. How about Jesus? Do you remember in John 8? One of those little stinkers. Tricked that woman, got her set up in adultery, and then brought her to Jesus. Remember that? We caught this woman in the act of adultery. How do you catch her in the act unless you set it up? Hypocrites. The law says stoner. What do you say, Jesus? They had him. 
If ever they had him, they had him. If he says, let her go, he violates the law. If he says, stone her, he's not the loving Messiah. And you remember what he did? He drew in the dirt till he heard from his father. And then what did he say? All right, whoever's got no sin, cast first stone. And what'd they do? They ran like scared rabbits. He fried them. He fried them. And what'd he do? He looked at that lady. He said, where are your accusers, sweetheart? They're gone. Neither do I condemn you. Now go. Sin no more. But go. It's okay. I think of Jesus in Matthew 12 when he, he challenged the Pharisees, these supposed shepherds of Israel. And he quoted Isaiah. And what did he say? He said, a bruised reed I will not break. What's that all about? Well, in the ancient world, reeds were all over the place. Rivers. Take a reed and you cut it out and you make a flute. So what if you're working on the flute and you, and you bend it? Well, it's not going to work anymore. No big deal. Toss it away. Get another reed. Start over. You can't do that with people. Jesus looks at us and says, are you a bruised reed? Has life overwhelmed you? I'll never cast you aside for another. I'll continue to work with the bruised reed till the bruised reed is healed. A dimly lit wick, he won't snuff out. What's that all about? Now you put wicks in oil, get light. When it burns down, the wick's not going to burn bright anymore. What do you do? I just snuff it out, get another wick. Is your light not shining very bright right now? Life's overwhelmed you. The Lord Jesus, he's never going to snuff out your light. He's going to meet you where you are. He's going to offer himself until your light starts to shine bright again. Jesus always stood ready to encourage the overwhelmed. Verse 14. Help the weak. Fascinating. Sometimes the faint-hearted become so faint-hearted that they can't stand anymore. Weak is asthenon. It means literally without strength. Could refer to spiritually without strength, physically without strength, even morally without strength. These are people that are just not up to the demand of life anymore and and in the King James, it says, help them. Literally, would be better support them. The word, I would translate it, cling to them. Hold them up. The word was used in Greek for a brace that held up a limb that didn't work anymore. In other words, be a crutch for the crippled. Lift them up. Help them walk again. This is somebody Jesus died for. You know, in our fast-paced, performance-oriented world that we live in, these are the people that are most often left behind and forgotten. We don't have time for them. We've got too much to do. They're seen as a drain on society, but Jesus never saw it that way. He saw people not for what they were, but for what they could be. He saw them always as somebody he died for. And they needed somebody to step into their life and hold them up again. Janet recently bought a plaque for me and brought it home. So good. It's going up in my office. Listen to this. Grace sat down with me until I could walk again. That's not just a cute phrase. Who is Grace. We are. We will sit down with people until they can walk again. To do that, verse 14, we're going to be need to be patient with all men. It means long suffering. It means to suffer long. It's not easy work. Sometimes you're going to want more for people than they want for themselves. 
And so you need a long fuse. 2 Corinthians 5 says, look at no man any longer after the flesh. See them in Christ. See them as brand new creations. See them not as they are, but what for they can be. I told this story many years ago. I trust you've all forgotten it and it'll impact you again. And we got a lot of new people. First church I ever served in, there was a guy named Gary. Gary had won a settlement against his company for an illness on the job and never had to work another day of his life again. And Gary got real lazy and Gary gained a lot of weight and Gary became very bitter because he was in a lot of pain and he threw his weight around and he had a lot of weight to throw around. He was like a porcupine. Nobody could get close to him at all. He wouldn't come to church. He'd go out in the foyer and just pace back and forth. Anybody talk to him, you'd get a rough cutting answer. Keep people away. That was his life's message. And the pastor left the church, and so I, I was the associate, and so I served as the interim until they found a new one. And Gary came into my office, and he said, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, Gary, sit down. I said, what you need? I've been thinking about going into the ministry. By the grace of God, I didn't laugh. It's the natural response. I looked at him and said, really? Well, that's exciting, Gary. Thank you, Spirit of God. I said, I've got some books here from some different seminaries. Let's look at them and see which one might fit for you. And over the next six months, Gary began to lose weight. He started wearing a tie to church. I mean, even I don't do that. <laughs> he started talking to people. He started serving as an usher. His wife came to me and said, I don't know what you did to my husband, but whatever you're doing, keep it up. And after about six months, Gary came into my office. And he said, do you remember about six months ago when I asked you about going into the ministry? I said, yeah. He said, you know, I had asked three other pastors about that, and they all laughed at me. You were the first one that encouraged me. This is what the Holy Spirit is talking about. Taking those people that the world can lose patience with, but continuing to offer ourselves to them, seeing them not for what they are, but for what they can be. You know, when you look at all this passage today, know and appreciate your leaders, live in peace, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, hold up the weak, Let's be honest. We're dealing with people. The leaders, they will very likely fail you. They're human. The people you're going to minister, they are very likely hurt you. The unruly can stab you and turn on you. The faint-hearted and small-souled will disappoint you. And you know what? In ministry, you're very likely to get hurt. There's a revelation for you. Sheep have fangs. They're called words. And words, Proverbs says, can go down into the inner part, most part of man and break the bones. Words can destroy you. And you're offering yourself to these sheep with fangs. So there's one final exhortation. It's in verse 15. As the Holy Spirit called the family together, look at what he said. When you get hurt, verse 15, never, no exceptions, never repay evil for evil, but always, no exceptions, Always seek after that which is good for all people. Never is an heiress verb, so it's not even one time. Not even one time. Let me tell you, that verse has really improved my prayer life. As I tell the Lord, can't we just this one time? <laughs> no, never. Never repay evil for evil. In fact, seek them. I want to circle that word. Literally means stalk them. With kindness. Pursue them with kindness. It could also be translated persecute them. The person who just hurt you, give it back to them with persecuting them with goodness. Oh, where do we sign up for that one? <laughs> what do we say to that? Well, we say Christianity is radical. Christianity is otherworldly. Just think about this. This charge runs counter to one of the strongest impulses known to man. This is a vice, revenge, 
that men in our world regard as a virtue. All Hollywood's got to do is create a plot where somebody gets hurt and they get their gun and go on a revenge and they've got a blockbuster movie. And we sit in it and go, yes, because it hits us right in our flesh. How about Lamech? Remember Lamech? Remember the book of Genesis? Cain messed up and murdered his brother Abel. Then Cain got kicked out of the the rest of the family. And Cain said, well, people are going to be out to get me. And so God gave a promise to Cain. I'm going to protect you sevenfold, Cain. If anyone hurts you, I'll hurt them seven times. It's okay, Cain. Two chapters later, Lamech comes along and he said, well, it was said that anybody hurts Cain seven times. If anybody hurts Lamech, Lamech returns at 70 times seven. It's arrogant. And the world loves it. Because our flesh loves it. So in the world, it's get your revenge. In the religious world, it's be good to those who are good to you. But in Christianity, it's love your enemies. <laughs> Do good to them. Now let's stop right there. Don't read that and pass it off. Let's think about it. How can he say that to us? Don, when somebody hurts you, I want you to persecute them with kindness. How can he say that to us? Doesn't he know what they've done to us? Doesn't he know that they need to be slapped in Jesus' name? (laughs) What about us? They hurt us. And, and, And the Holy Spirit says this is a command without exception? How can he demand that of us? What's the answer? We're not who we used to be. We have been given new hearts. We are the ones who've been given beautiful hearts. I see an assembly with beautiful hearts. And do you know why your hearts were made beautiful? So the beautiful one could come and live inside them and express his love and his kindness and the beauty of his own life to a world that so desperately needs it. May I say this? How beautiful is the body of Christ? How beautiful is the body of Christ? Saints, or should we say brethren, when you're a preacher type, You always want to end with a dynamic story or illustration to try to cement the message into the heart so it'll stay there a while. I couldn't find one. But I did find a young lady in our assembly. Anna? Come on up, baby girl. And Hannah's going to sing for us about this beautiful body of Christ. And we're going to put the words up so you can meditate on them. And I want to pray. Father, this isn't just Hannah singing to them or for them. This is Hannah singing over them. Like you yourself sing over the body. As she sings over the body, quicken our hearts with the truth of how beautiful this body is when it functions the way you intended it to. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, and the truth of your love and your grace.
Would you stand? Father, I bless this assembly in the name of the Most High God of Israel. Thank you for opening their eyes to the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May they walk the path of the beautiful one, expressing the life of the beautiful one, the love of the King, the hands that serve so that we may touch other lives with the life that transform. Make it so, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.